Good morning. In the fourth chapter of Luke, a few chapters before what we'll read together in a moment, Luke describes and lays out what is for his gospel, the first of Jesus' detailed public ministry events, or, or another thing, it's, it's actually his first recorded sermon in Luke's gospel. As he's home in Nazareth, he's in the synagogue, and he stands up and reads from the prophet Isaiah, a beautiful passage that promises deliverance and freedom and recovery, and then he rolls up the scroll and shares these words. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the congregation goes wild. So the congregation goes what? No, okay, never mind. But think about it first. Oh, hey, all right. I heard that. But think about it though. For after years, generations of struggle, of wandering, of oppression, they're reminded by this man that God will deliver them. And they realize that his promise is not just that it will be fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled in their time and even in their hearing. So they are, of course, ecstatic and they begin to celebrate aloud with one another, all except one of them, who's Jesus, doesn't join in the celebration and he continues, in fact, he even begins to push back against the celebration. He reminds people that from their own history, from the history of their faith, that God has worked through people who do not look like them, live like them, or even believe like them. He names the, the widow at Zarephath and Naaman the Syrian, two among many who by Israel's own standards were unclean and excluded and unworthy. And yet God chose to work through them for God's people and the world. And that manages to change their celebration into anger, even, dare I say, rage, as they drive Jesus not just from the synagogue, but from the town, and even try to kill him. Now, two chapters later, in Luke 6, which we'll read together in just a moment, Jesus gives his next recorded sermon. And so let's see together if he learned his lesson and tones it down a little bit. Spoiler alert, he does not. All right. Let's read together from Luke 6, beginning at the 17th verse. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Would you pray with me? Loving God, as we hear these familiar and difficult words once again. As they resound in this space, in this time, and we pray, God, in our hearts, open us up 
to the presence and movement of your spirit. Open us up to the ongoing ministry of Christ in the world. And so, God, I pray in these moments you would speak through me, and if need be, in spite of me, so that your word alone would be heard. Amen. So I want to begin with, uh, with a story that I have not been able to get out of my head uh, since working on this particular sermon. And it's one that I would imagine many of you are familiar with because it was kind of a big deal. But um, some years ago, two convicts escaped from prison with help by, from one of the, the corrections officers, no less. And they, they actually hid out at his home that first night, got themselves cleaned up, and managed to walk free as a bird, a hundred miles to another town. And they said, okay, here is where we'll, we'll settle in. Now, having been recently extricated from incarceration, you would think, of course, they'd keep a low profile, but no, it's not what happened. They went right back to their old ways and that did not go unnoticed. And in about three days after their arrival, many people in the town were noticing and realizing and they had had enough. They decided that the police were not acting fast enough and so they started to get roused up. I mean, quite frankly, it was more like a riot. The townspeople deciding they take matters into their own hands and when they couldn't find the convicts, they went straight to the authorities of the city and they said, look, you got to do something here. These guys are, they're, they're disrupting the peace. They are turning the world upside down. Their decrees are against Caesar and they are preaching this new king named Jesus. You see, Paul and Silas, they, they riled things up pretty much everywhere they went. This was in Thessalonica, about 100 miles from Philippi, and neither of those were the last places that they would uh, get things going, disturbing the peace, turning the world upside down. And they did so by preaching the message of Jesus. And because of that, the charges were disturbing the peace. Here in Acts 16 and 17, that story I just shared with you as the rioters begged for help against these Christian evangelists, they said it's because they are turning the world upside down. Now, why do I bring this up? <laughs> Why do I bring in, frankly, another passage as if the first is not precarious enough on its own? And here's the deal. It raises a question for me. You see, I've been a pastor now for almost seven years. And throughout that time, I have had the privilege of preaching weekly, which by my count means that's well over 300 sermons, some of which have been delivered two or three times in a day. So here's my question, guys. Where's the riot? Where's my riot? No one has ever rioted in response to my sermon. And I'm not trying to say I'm as good a preacher as Paul or Silas. I know I'm not, but goodness gracious, y'all just look so comfortable. <laughs> I actually think that's a good question, but that's, that's, maybe that's another sermon. But here's the point. How did Jesus... Who, who, who got himself and his followers into constant trouble in the first century becomes such a popular presence in our world today. Not many, or I should say all of us, most of us at the very least, profess our faith openly with our, our clothes or jewelry or maybe bumper stickers on our car and we expect it from others. We expect our political candidates, for example, to wear their faith on their sleeves and if they don't, we wonder why. And obviously a riot is not anywhere near my goal, but I do wonder at times, how does Christianity fit so snugly and comfortably into our surroundings these days? How, how does it work at times almost without disruption? How does the message that Paul and Silas preached and countless others that got them locked up over it become in our world today commonplace, borderline innocuous? Has Jesus adapted, e evolved with the changing times? Are, are we more faithful, more devout, more holy? Or do we sometimes trade an orientation skewing message of Jesus for one that makes the world sit steady and be a little more comfortable? That's the question 
that I ask myself, and, and I think it's the question that Jesus answers in this sermon of his. It's to that very reality, that very challenge, that then and now, that Jesus comes down amidst his disciples and those hungry for not just his message, but his healing, and stands among us, challenging that we might open ourselves to something different. But not just something a little different, something a lot different. Blessed are the rich? No, no. Woe to the rich. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger and be wary, you sated. Blessed even are those who weep now and look out those that laugh. Blessed are those that are rejected. The popular will fall. That is an upside down world. And it's one that Luke has prepared us for. In the first chapter of Luke, as Mary sings her Magnificat, Some of those words include God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted the lowly, has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. In the passage that Jesus reads in Luke 4 to mark the fulfilling of scripture, the promise of deliverance and freedom and recovery, Isaiah's words are, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is not describing things how they are in the world around them or certainly around us or even simply how things will be one day. It's the both and of the kingdom of God, the already and the not yet, this world upending way of life that gives value in new ways and in new places and warns us against putting our trust elsewhere. See, the warning of the message is against uh, the ways of the world or, or, or suggests the world, I should say, the world which promotes and suggests some very different goals, some very different blessings. And if I might try my hand at some of those, blessed are those whose portfolios promise a comfortable retirement. Blessed are those who are born into good families. Countless advantages are ahead of them. Blessed are those with a good education. Their degrees and titles will open doors for them. But note, please note, and and I admit as someone who has one of those titles, who has five years of graduate school, who puts away money every month for retirement, and just for good measure, if you don't know I have that title, I wear the collar, so you better know it, right? (laughs) Please know that Jesus is not saying to them, to us, to me, to you, that to be rich or happy or secure or liked is a sin, I mean, certainly there are ways of acquiring those things, those states that that would be, but none of them are inherently sinful. The invitation from the Messiah is to change our perspective. And the warning is to avoid the perspective of the world, to put our trust instead in those things in, in ways that would and do remove our reliance upon God. And by reliance, I mean like a a full-bodied reliance, not simply a reliance that trusts or or professes a faith in a God, in a world that, that welcomes it, but a reliance on God that is a living into God's kingdom, a living into this upside-down perspective that he presents at the start of his, his sermon. That, that, that feels things changing, being upended and moved or even turned upside down as our perspective shifts to be more like God's. From the opening words of this sermon, we're reminded the poor, the hungry, the distraught, the rejected are especially blessed. And that's upside down. 
But for God, they are beloved because God loves us all. And where they, and yes, we at times find ourselves in those states is inhuman and contrary to God's will. And so Jesus calls us to something different, to reorder our priorities and see and be a part of God's gratuitous love as it reaches out to those in need. That's the kingdom Jesus calls us to be a part of. The rich, the full, the delighted and well-regarded are often at risk, Jesus says, and that is upside down. But they are, they're they're at risk because the world has given them opportunities to make it on their own, to seek not God but our own capacity and miss the opportunity to be engaged in God's kingdom because the world has given us so much. So again, Jesus calls us to something different precisely because God loves us all to reorder our priorities and to see and be a part of God's gratuitous love reaching out to those in need including those who may not even be aware of that need. Because if we can at least agree on one thing today, I think it might be this. The world still needs Jesus. Which means it still needs to be turned upside down. I'm reminded of the words of one of my favorite theologians, Johnny Cash. Um, who offered the the catchy challenge that we can get so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. I would also suggest that the reverse of that is true and that that might be a way we can carry with us these challenges and calls from Jesus that we can get so earthly minded that we become of no heavenly good. So reliant on the kingdom of the world that we might become a limited use to the kingdom of God. If we find ourselves so invested and reliant and trusting in the other options all around us. And I got to tell you, my friends, this is a call that is not just particularly challenging, but it's, it's a little scary to me. And not just because it's so countercultural in ways that are difficult, to say the least, to live into or understand, but because I'm reminded of the response to his first sermon that I alluded to, the sermon in Luke chapter 4, when the, when the congregation heard his words, when they were reminded that God works through unexpected people, and that, that's not the part that, that scares me. Frankly, it doesn't get more scriptural than that, the idea that God works through those that we might not expect God to. And, and really, it's not even the, the violence of their reaction that unnerves me. What scares me is how Jesus responds. As they walk him towards the cliff with the intention of throwing him off of it, the last verse of that chapter simply says, Jesus passes through the midst of them and goes on his way. My friends, what scares me is that Jesus is going to keep on at it. Jesus is going to go along his way even without those who had the chance to join him. The truth of this message, this opening of the Sermon on the Plain, is not reward one day for those who have it bad now and punishment for those who have it good. No, it's a a warning that in the kingdom of God, we can be so earthly minded, so focused on wealth and security, on happiness and popularity, that we will miss the chance to be a part of what God is doing. And when that happens, Jesus will pass through the midst of us and go on his way. Because the ministry of Jesus, the work of God's kingdom, will continue with or without us. And I I, want to be a part. I want to be a part of what God is doing, and I'll bet you do too. So I pray in response to Jesus' sermon, his invitation, his challenge, that we will invite God to continue to change our perspective, upend what we believe, and make us more heavenly minded. Would you pray with me?
Loving God, come to where we are and shake us up. Push us where we need to be pushed. Upend us where we need to be upended. So that we might find ourselves hearing and seeing and loving as you do. So that we might be a part of your continued ministry here on earth. Amen.